Welcome to News Click. The defense budget forms a very important part of the financial, uh, the budget for, for uh, the year 2020-21, uh, like all previous years. Uh, nearly 16% of government's total expenditure has been allocated for defense, which includes defense pensions also. And uh, it comes to around 2.1% of the gross domestic product of India. But if you go by SIPRI's method of calculating military budget, which includes investment or allocations made for paramilitary formations, or which are meant for so-called internal security, then we find that the defense budget increases or the military budget increases from 4.71 lakh crores to 5.57 thousand crores, which is a stupendous amount, which comes to roughly 2.5-2.6% of the GDP. Now, keeping these rough figures in mind, because these are large numbers, the most important feature of this budget is that the maximum increase that has taken place in the defense budget this time is on account of defense pensions, which has increased by nearly 14%. In contrast to this hike in defense pension, allocations for defense pension, rest of the allocations have increased by no more than 3% on an average. It's therefore the manpower costs or the pension costs including the manpower cost, becomes a critical factor for, for any uh, defense planning that has to be done in this country about in terms of acquisition of modern weapons, upgradation, uh, investments in uh, industries, uh, in defense industries, military industries. We have with us D. Raghunandan, member of Delhi Science Forum and a defense analyst with uh, NewsClick, to take us through some of the highlights of the defense budget, uh, especially the rising manpower costs, which have been repeatedly been cited as one of the reasons why government of India finds that it is woefully short of funds to allocate for capital acquisitions of the, def of the defense sector. Raghu, welcome to NewsClick. So my first question is, it's very clear from taking a look at the defense, the overall budget allocations, that there is a stupendous increase in defense pension. If you take defense pension and the pay allowances uh, of, of uh, service personnel, especially in the Indian Army, not so much in the Navy and Air Force, we find that the manpower costs are taking away large chunk of resources which are otherwise allocated. So how do we, how do you look at it as a, as a... Well, two aspects obviously stand out. Yes. One is, as you said, the very fact that pensions, manpower costs, etc. are such a large proportion of the defense uh, budget. And naturally, if you take the total defense budget and pensions and manpower costs are such a high uh, percentage, then the amount of money left for capital expenditure is very small. And given the financial constraints the government is working under at present, uh, which don't allow much for expansion of the total defense budget, this restricts the capital expenditure that you can make, which essentially means, as far as the uh, public is concerned, the military has embarked on a program of modernization of the armed forces, hmm. which requires buying of new equipment. And if you don't have money for capital expenditure, the modernization program of the armed forces is going to suffer. There's no getting away uh, from that. But internal to the issue of uh, manpower expenditure and pensions, I would say there are two distinct aspects which need to be addressed separately. The first is pensions. And the second is the running costs mm. of manpower. Uh, if you look at pension separately, which is where the largest increase mm. has been uh, registered, uh, this is largely due to two reasons. Uh, one, of course, is the one rank, one pension uh, scheme, which has jacked up the amount of pension uh, requirements uh, that you have, 
which is by the way bulk of the effect of which is going to start kicking in now the second aspect is the duration of service of the armed uh, forces personnel which used to be an average of 7 years earlier is today an average of 17 years which means that virtually every serviceman becomes entitled to full pension for the rest of his life now that obviously poses a huge uh, burden on the uh, pensions and salaries uh, account so i think essentially what this implies in the future is you need to cut down on manpower costs and especially pensions the pension uh, structure depends on how you structure the uh, manpower resources of the armed forces and ideally you should not be looking for very long term uh, service but look for shorter duration service and faster rotation of uh, personnel which will reduce the pension uh, burden but i think even more importantly india just like it has been stuck with legacy equipment on the capital side is also stuck with an antiquated structure of the army which is heavily dependent on having a large number of service personnel which reflects a very outmoded concept of uh, the army and of battle scenarios which are no longer relevant uh, in the world today uh i could elaborate on that further if we have time uh, we can go into that no, let's restrict ourselves but at the moment the, yeah. i'll i'll stop with that uh since defense pension and manpower costs have been cited as one of the main reasons for for uh, making a capital acquisitions uh slow or inadequate uh the next question that comes to mind is that well fine defense pensions you can't do anything about because it's a deferred wage yeah. and it's a commitment yeah. which has been made and no but i mean a sovereign government having given this no, promise obviously. cannot pull out from it no. so that's going to be a fixed cost whether we like it or not having said that what are the ways in which manpower costs can be contained yeah. that is the the, the larger right. issue so as i said there, there are two two major ways as you said pension is a deferred wage yeah uh and it is support for you as a retired government employee and a defense employee yeah. for the rest of your uh, yeah. natural life what has already been committed is one part mm. what you can do is to restructure the structure of the armed forces for the future so that the future generation of entrants into the armed forces do not become such a large uh, uh burden on pension uh, right. funds like i said essentially by shortening the duration of service of bulk of the personnel and making suitable arrangements for alternative employment of retired of service personnel who leave the services in other avenues of uh, employment so that but ragu the problem that one has encountered because i remember even the previous finance commission had recommended that there should be a uh, horizontal shift i mean people who retire from armed forces personnel could be accommodated in the central paramilitary formations yeah. okay that would be one way of one way. reducing the manpower costs in one yeah. even if it increases in the other you are able to keep yeah. it within a, a certain but there was reluctance on the on part of the ministry of home affairs and it came from the organizations themselves itbp bsf uh, all of them themselves put their foot down by saying that this will not do yeah uh, so there was this problem in terms of accommodating them how do you reduce there is no way one can reduce the numbers so it's only in the future that one can yes. say the impact yes, that's right. as you, you said you can't do it at present okay. yeah. now the cds has already on record of saying that they are thinking in terms of restructuring the army whereby precisely what you suggested is what probably will be in 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 force which is that there'll be shorter 
uh, there will be a greater uh, rotation, rotation of, of and uh, the, the and period would duration. be seven to nine years. So that's that right. more and more and, and the, the youthful uh, nature of the infantry battalions especially can be retained. That is one way. But there is another issue that is also linked to it when one looks, sees it. If we go by Cipri's character, uh, definition of military budget, which also includes the paramilitary formations, uh, which are, by the way, trained along the same lines as the infantry battalions of the army. And from our own history, we know that these are also modeled on the Irish constabulary's uh, model for uh, the colonies that they followed. If we include that, we find that there has been a stupendous increase in personnel of the paramilitary formations. Simultaneously, as there has been an increased augmentation in the strength of the army, yeah. as a result of their internal security yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, duties and where they've been involved. Yeah. Now, the current army chief is on record in his first public statement saying that the army wants to go back to its primary role of defending the border Absolutely. and move away from its secondary role. Absolutely. How do you see that? Do you think that this is, there is a possibility of breaking away from our... See, militarily, of course. I mean, it uh, does not make sense uh, for the military to be saddled with uh, uh, so many uh, duties mm. in uh, counter-insurgency operations within India. The military should be brought in or re is required to be brought in only when things have gone beyond control. And I don't see that happening because most of the insurgencies around are low-grade uh, insurgencies and don't really call for such large deployments as we have seen course, yeah. in the recent uh, past. What is required more, and this again relates to the kind of military as well as paramilitary that you are looking for is a more technology intensive military rather than a manpower intensive mm. Uh, mm. military. This whole idea of hordes of army uh, or hordes of police uh, people going in is I think a very antiquated concept and uh, does not relate to present uh, conditions of either insurgency or of uh, warfare. Raghu, let's move from the manpower to the capital side yeah. briefly. Now, although the, in, the allocation have risen now to 1 lakh 18 lakh crores, uh, it's still, I mean, the people are still unhappy because it's not sufficient sure. to meet all the requirement. Sure. Now, this is an issue that has uh, plagued Indian Armed Forces for a long time, yes. that they need more but there is not sufficient fund. Yeah. But there is also a third question. We have failed somewhere in creating an indigenous military industrial complex which could meet our requirements and our needs. And therefore, we are always looking for big ticket items to be bought from abroad, which are always at a, at a high price. And especially because if there are emergency purchases, the price shoot up. Given that what, that our pi is limited, how do, does, uh, what should the government do in order to make maximum use of the limited resource, scarce resources that we have? I think there are three aspects to this uh, question and without elaborating too much on each, I'll just summarize the three aspects. The first is uh, the military as it is structured today is uh, overloaded with legacy equipment. Mm. Something like 70 to 75 percent of the equipment uh, with all three uh, services, but particularly in the army, are legacy equipment, meaning they are 40 to 50 year old uh, types of uh, weaponry. So there is urgent need for modernization if you want to restructure uh, the armed forces to meet the requirements and demands of contemporary mm. uh, warfare. Uh, having said that, uh, if this is to be achieved, clearly you need to have money to spend on modernizing your uh, armed mm. forces, 
restructuring the armed forces which will involve more expenditure in the short term but leading to savings of money in the medium yeah, long, yeah. Uh, to long term because as all militaries have modernized the modernization has come with a reduction in numbers of the armed forces uh, you mean including the personnel and including the, the personnel very much including the personnel and the best example i can give is our friends to the north uh, china in china china has embarked on a massive modernization program in their military which involves not just acquisition of new and modern weapons and network centric mm. uh, systems but simultaneously a very serious reduction in their armed forces if you remember and think back mm. to the indo china war of 1962 the talk then in military circles and military historians will tell you yeah. today was that the chinese used numbers of armed forces to overwhelm uh, the opponents the chinese army is no longer like that china has cut its uh, armed forces personnel particularly in the army by more than 1 million in the last 10 years that's a huge reduction we are thinking uh, in terms of reducing 100000 over the next 5 years yes but that is too small a number we have got a such a huge standing army compared to even to china uh, whose army strength now is more or less at par with india's despite having a huge long border with russia to the north having a border with india to the south and having all kinds of other uh, ambitious uh, projection of their uh, military but they are doing all this by modernizing military equipment and reducing the number of armed forces personnel because modern warfare does not involve sending 200000 soldiers in the trenches <laughs> that's not the way wars are fought uh these days so you don't require that many people so i think india should embark on a crash program in the next 5 to 10 years mm. of simultaneously reducing the strength of the armed forces while increasing the technology content of the uh thing and therefore uh, increasing the modernization of our forces the third aspect mm. is the aspect of indigenization that you mm. indigenization in the short term is not going to save you money let me put It'll it clearly be because it, well more expensive or equally expensive because you will start off being more expensive because your skill levels are still low your productivity will be low your numbers may not scale up hmm. but gradually once you achieve scale and your skills and productivity is improve then your costs will start coming down provided you have invested again some money in research which will reflect back in the amount of technology that you see a lot of the so called indigenous equipment mm. we are making in india today still contains 40% of crucial components which are imported or so, part of joint ventures with some oe either way so if you want to substitute those also through indigenous uh, manufacture you need to spend money on research so again it's the same thing as we were saying earlier in order to achieve savings in the longer run you need to make investments in the uh, short term it's very clear that we are going to remain uh, lack resources adequate enough to meet all the requirements of the armed forces uh, which they list yes for some time to come yes. especially now because of the economic slowdown the reduction in tax revenue we don't know what the future holds in terms of the economy etc etc now the government is thinking of moving away from budget allocations to some other means to find resources for the military now one of the things that they had asked the 15th uh, finance commission to look into was so uh, to disc- to to come out with some method by which uh external security as well as internal security could get non lapsable funds and this has been an old standing demand of the parliamentary standing committee on defense yes. several standing committees have made the same recommendations now the real 
uh, issue that blocks the, the acts as an obstruction is Article 266 of the Indian Constitution, which relates to Consolidated Fund of India. And it's uh, clause one makes it very clear that once a fund is, uh, whatever funds are left, it becomes part of Consolidated Fund of India. And you can't withdraw it yeah. without the parliament approving it through a demand for grant. Sure. Now that's the only tricky point. But the real issue there nevertheless remains, even if you have to find, I may mean, create a non-lapsable fund, where do you find that surplus which will become part of the non-lapsable fund. And therein comes a suggestion from the Ministry of Defense. They're like, let's have another round of cess meant for defense. How do you, how do you look at that? Uh, again, I'll give my response in two parts. One is with regard to lapsable funds. Uh, I think that point is moot mm -hmm. today because it's been a long time uh, since the allocation of the budget mm -hmm has been so much that the defense forces have had to surrender uh, money because every year they used to this was see uh, even if you look at this year's budget the amount of budget allocation for capital expense mm. is less than the amount already committed from the previous year for equipment that you have already purchased so where is the question of returning the money it's I mean, already so I, exhausted it's already exhausted before you've received it in fact you don't have money for fresh Mm. acquisitions. India has got a long list of acquisitions it is going to make. Submarines, uh, warships, uh, fighter aircraft, uh, marine uh, uh, aircraft carrier based, aircraft carriers and so on. There is no money for any of these mm. because the money that you have got for capital acquisition is to pay for what you have already ordered or acquired and leaving you nothing for new uh, equipment. So, you will still be left juggling balls in the air uh, when you're. So, I think that point is now moot. We have moved way past that uh, point. So, if cess is what is uh, required to be done, yes, provided the Indian public has to be assured that this is not good money being thrown after the bad. See, we are already, as I said, lumbered with a inefficient, oversized, uh, out-of-date military. And if you need to support that by having more money coming in, then it's pointless. Unless you draw up a firm, publicly, seemingly viable hmm. uh, program of military modernization, which involves expenditure in the short term in order to obtain savings in the long term. Mm. Then the public will see the justification uh, of this. Therefore, you should be able to draw up a plan that we will spend more now through the cess, which will then save us budgetary allocations in the five to ten year uh, The only time problem, horizon. Raghu, again, as you pointed out, the only problem is even educational cess, which government of India has been imposing for number of years. It has accumulated more than rupees 90,000 crores, which has not been availed of. That is, that is precisely the point I was making. So, in the, in the military sector, that is not the problem today. Today, the problem is not if I get money, I will not be able to spend it. You have already spent more than what you uh, require. So, today, there will be no problem of that in terms of defense expenditures. But, we should ensure that any amount of money that is allocated fresh hmm. goes into modernization of the services, not in running expenses or revenue expenditure of the uh, services, goes in for modernization, which will assist in a plan where running expenses and uh, manpower costs are seen to reduce over the next 5 to 10 years. Because then you can say, we have got this much extra money now, we will save that much extra money by uh, reducing the manpower let's, let's over hope, 5 to 10 years. Let's hope uh, that, they, they, that they... That's the only they way are, to do it. That they are careful yeah. uh, and they plan yeah. well in advance. That's right. Thank you, Raghu, for today. Uh, this is all for now. Uh, keep watching news, news Click and if you have any comments or feedback, do write to us. Thank <laughs> you.